Hi, welcome to Fast Forward. We are here at Capclave in 2016 with one of the guests of honor, Tim Powers. Tim, welcome to Fast Forward. Oh, thank you. Happy to be aboard. Yeah, and uh, welcome to Capclave. That too. Yeah, having a good time? Yeah, great convention. It is, it is. Um, I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about research for you. Because one thing I've been curious about, having read your book since a, a Drawing of the Dark, which goes back a ways, um, is, is your, are your stories driven by the research, or do you start coming up with a story and then dive into research? They definitely arise from the research. Um, before I do the research, I have no idea what the story will be. Um, this may partly be um, because if you let the research provide you with the story, you don't actually need imagination. Uh, what I do is I'll find some situation that looks likely to provide the basis of a story. Um, gamblers in early Las Vegas, um, pirates in the Mediterranean with voodoo and the Fountain of Youth. You know, you, I'd look at those and think, there's probably the basis of a story in that. Do some research. And then I do the research, and I try to, in all these books and whatnot, uh, note things that are too cool not to use, which, with the right kind of paranoid schizophrenic squint, any biography will provide you with. I think I could read a biography of Beatrix Potter and find clues, aha, uh -huh. what was she really, what was you know, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle really supposed to be? Um, and if I can find 10 or 20 or 30 things that are too cool not to use, then by definition, I've got 20 or 30 parts of my eventual book. And the task is to connect the dots. Um, so I go looking for what my story will be and let the research provide me with it. I never have a story in mind and then say, now do research to fill it in. Uh, if I did that, I would probably find that uh, the actual existing research would blow it to pieces. It would turn out the story I arrived with simply won't be sustained by uh, the, the, the time period and place uh, I was hoping it would be. Yeah, Kim Philby wasn't there at yeah, that right. time. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't there. What are you going to do? Yeah, huh. <clears throat> because I've, I've noticed and, and things I've read is that the real people you have in your book, and most of them are <laughs> in a lot a of lot ways. A lot of them are, yeah. Um, the time, the timeline of the people ties in exactly with what you write. Yeah, I do make it a rule when I'm dealing with an actual historical period uh, and people acting within it. Um, I'll make a calendar, um, and I make it a rule. I can't mess with the calendar. I can't omit a month uh, f just because it might be handier for my first approximation at a plot to do that. And I can't have characters be elsewhere than where hist history says they were. I can't have them um, fail to meet somebody history says they did meet. I have to approach it kind of as a cold case detective uh, and say, okay, given these facts, um, what might be the secret story behind it? What were they really up to? I know what history says they were up to, but that was all cover. It's no fun. Yeah, and really if you approach it with that paranoid schizophrenic squint, you will come up with clues. You will say, oh, well, now check that out. Because real life will provide irrational behavior, random actions, uh, strange coincidences. And of course, in real life, these things mean nothing. Uh, he was drunk. He, he opened the wrong door. He read the street sign wrong. Uh, he was in a bad mood. He was being contrary. But uh, for the purposes of fiction, I can say, no, no, those were actually shrewd moves. There was nothing random about it, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, is not true. Right. That's one thing I was, I was curious about was because so many of your books are tied up in 
Oh, there's secret histories, hidden histories, uh, histories, interstitial histories, yes. and conspiracies. Do you, in real life, believe in all the conspiracies? Uh, no. No, I made them up. I, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> although, although it often happens that um, when I'm just about to start writing, and I've virtually done all the research, and I've cooked up my secret supernatural backstory of what was really going on, very often I'll have one last research book to look through, and it will confirm my theory. And I think, <laughs> oh my God, I'm not making this up. I've stumbled onto the real truth about what Kim Philby mm -hmm. was doing with uh, Moscow and the British Secret Service. And then I think, the NSA is probably aware of the direction your research has taken. Right now, you're sitting right by a window. Right now, mm -hmm. out in the dark, there's an assassin lining your head up in a telescopic sight. So I go to bed. Yeah, that's a and good thing to do. And in the morning, I don't think that anymore. <laughs> um, but no, in general, no, I, I, I don't think uh, Bugsy Siegel was really the Fisher King or Byron was really being chased around by vampires. Vampire, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a feeling you didn't really believe it because your fiction is too good about them. Well, also you, know what, they, you know what I mean? It's, it's, if you believed it, I don't think the fiction would be as good. Well, if you believed it, you probably wouldn't feel called on to shore up the plausibility a lot. Yeah. You'd think, it doesn't need plausibility. It's true. What do you want? Um, now, you mentioned all the actual characters you have in your book. There is one character that has been in some of your books and also in some of your old college friend James Blaylock, who I'm a huge fan of. I know where books. you're going with this. You're, I'm going to William Ashbliss. Yes. Um, well, the way that happened is that uh, Jim Blaylock and I were both in college together in the early 70s, and that was still close enough to 1969 that the poetry the school paper published was idiotic, pretentious, children playing on the beach and flowers and rainbows and stuff like that. And uh, so we figured we could write poetry that would sound more portentous and uh, profound, but which would have absolutely no meaning or value at all if looked at twice. And so we got out a piece of paper and I would write a line and pass it to him. He'd write the next line and pass it back. And when we got to the bottom of the page, we'd bring it to a close. And Line by line, some of it sounded uh, impressive. I remember one line was, heavy on my brow sits the cold dog of the snows. Um, yeah. Yates would have been proud yeah. to come up with that. But um, we sent it to the school paper, and they did publish it, all this stuff. And So we wrote another lot that was dumber, and they published that. And we wrote a third lot that was dumber still, and they did not publish that. You, you reach that threshold of stupidity. Their threshold, yeah, uh, low bar. But um, but having made up this poet, and we figured we needed a name for him, and I said it should be one of those two-word names, like Wordsworth, Longfellow. So we each made up a syllable and came up with Ash Bless. And then after we started publishing books, we anytime we needed a kind of a crazy William Blake type poet, we'd use William Ash Bless. And at one point, I had sold a book to Ace Books, and then Blaylock sent them a book, and both of us used the character William Ashbless. And the editor said, do you guys know each other? <laughs> um, and Blaylock said, I'm sorry, did Powers use Ashbless? I'll, I'll change the name. And she said, no, 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 make it the same guy. Well, one guy's in like 1950, and one guy's in 1810. She says, well, figure that out. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Well, yeah. fantasy, what yeah. the hell. The two of you can do it. And ever since, Ash Bless for me has been kind of a good luck charm. Uh, I, I kind of think I should put him in every book. And I don't want readers to say, oh, hey, Powers, we had an Ash Bless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, um, so I, I'll put it in a different language. Seniza Bendiga, Ashe Segnen. So I want it in there for luck, but I don't want it to be conspicuous. And I find it fascinating that you and Blaylock were in college together because both of you work in the secret histories in your book. You mm -hmm. both 
you know, do that, and you both do it so well. Is this something you guys were into playing with when you were together in college? It was kind of an interesting mix in that uh, we met uh, at this sort of literary gathering, this old Irish lady teacher hosted, um, and she was brilliant, knew everything about literature and mythology and would correct our stories when we blundered in those things. But I came out of fandom, really, uh, Lovecraft, Heinlein, Liber, Sturgeon, et cetera. And Blaylock somehow came from Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, William Gerhardy. Yeah. Uh, had never heard of, Edgar Rice Burroughs, had, but had never heard of Heinlein. Um, and so we collided and exchanged enthusiasms and, uh, and we're critiquing each other's stuff furiously. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, there is a whole lot of overlap between us. Yeah, and, and knowing that he came out of that, that Verne and all that. And yeah, you that, can see that, that in Blaylock that, very clearly. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, like talk to you a little bit about uh, Philip K. Dick, who was, I think, a neighbor, a friend, maybe a mentor. Yeah, he, um, he had been guest of honor at a convention in Vancouver, Canada. And at the end of the convention, he said to the con committee, can I stay? I don't want to go back. Can somebody put me up? Um, because back home, his house had been virtually blown up. The police had said, if you stay in town, you'll probably be killed. And so he figured anywhere but home. Uh, and so he stayed in Vancouver for some months, but then wrote to a professor at Cal State Fullerton down in Orange County, California, saying, I got nowhere to go. And the professor read that letter in class, and a couple of girls in the class said, we just lost a roommate. Tell him he could come stay with us. And so Phil Dick just said, OK, and got on an airplane, knowing no more than that. Wow. Uh, and I knew the two girls. And they said, uh, you want to go to the airport and pick up Philip K. Dick? I said, sure. Luckily, I had not read much of him. Mm. <laughs> uh, if I had, I would not have been able to speak. Anytime I've met writers I very much admire, Heinlein, Asimov, Liber, all I can do is stammer and spit. Uh, you know, man, yeah, man, Mr. Liber, <laughs> your books, I'm an idiot. <laughs> and I rush away. But, uh, but luckily I had not read much Phil Dick, so I was able to speak. And, um, and then he lived his last 10 years down in Orange County and um, I knew him throughout that time, and Blaylock and K.W. Jeter, and we all sort of hung around and wasted time and chatted about all kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then you ended up winning, I think it was two Philip K. Dick Awards? Yeah, that, that was must, That must have been that pretty was, cool. That was very gratifying, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's his, his award named after him. I like to think his ghost would have approved. Yeah. Now you're really thought of as a California guy in a lot of ways, but you were born in Buffalo. Born in Buffalo, that's right. Uh, moved to California when I was seven, and um, really all I remember about Buffalo is snow. Um, yeah. I remember my father going out in the morning and looking at a bumpy white row, which was cars, and you had to knock it off to find your mm -hmm. car. And so ever since then, I've... Um, I tried to avoid any encounter with snow. I don't even like it in movies. Did, did, did anything from Buffalo influence anything in your writing? Or was Nothing it too, too long ago? Nothing about the place, really. I mean, I've, well, yes, yes. We lived in a big old house that had belonged to my grandfather, who in the 1920s was mayor of Buffalo, George Zimmerman. And by the time I came along, the family fortunes had declined so that the house, uh, we had several families living in it, all our family, and the third floor had originally been a ballroom, no walls, one enormous room. And when we arrived, it was completely filled back to front, side to side, and floor to ceiling with Victorian furniture. And so us kids could crawl around 
and there was no cubic yard in that ballroom from the ceiling to the floor that we couldn't physically occupy. And that actually was much scarier than you'd imagine. Because mm. you get into the middle of the room, say here, and you think you heard a noise from five <laughs> yards south and down. Um, and then you imagine probably there's a little boy who got lost in here back in the 1890s <laughs> and has been waiting for another little boy to come so he could show him all the like fountain pens and cuff buttons that he found in drawers. And they think, let me out of here. How did I get here? How am I going to get out again? Now, that reminds me of a little bit of the house in Medusa's Web, your latest novel. Did that? Yeah, yeah, the kind of that, the that kind of house that's ballroom big enough, upstairs. Yeah, and the, that a, a kid would find limitless. Yeah. And, and when we were kids, we would go out front and look at the front of the house, and there was always one window we could not find from inside. Mm. We could find the one on that side of it and that side, but from inside we could never find one certain window, and that, of course. <laughs> will get the right kind of imagination working in yeah, a kid. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mentioned Medusa's Web, your latest book, which blew me away. The, oh, the man, idea of the concept of it with the two-dimensional little drawing of like a spider being able to yeah. send people through time and into other bodies, where the hell did that come from? Well, you know... <laughs> It came from uh, a Cord Wainer Smith story called uh, The Game of Rat and Dragon. It, it's a sort of space opera story, but um, the antagonists were these creatures which were two dimensional. And Cord Wainer Smith didn't go into any detail about how a two dimensional creature could threaten you. But I thought, what a cool notion. Two, I mean, end on, they're invisible. Um, so I thought, see if you can't have uh, the, the threat be some kind of two-dimensional creature. And then, of course, you think of Flatland by uh, Abbott yeah. uh, and, and Mr. A Square uh, and, and all that's kind of fun stuff to play with. Yeah, because when I finished reading it, I went, that's the strangest concept I might have seen, even for you. <laughs> and it's like, and how did he manage to pull it off? It's like, it, it almost makes no sense, but then it does. Oh, it totally makes sense, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, it just I, I sort of take Abbott's flatland mm -hmm. creatures, and um, obviously they could be transferred on a piece of paper. In fact, I suppose with those, if you had carbon paper, you could do a clone. <laughs> clone. There you go. Ha! I didn't even think of that. Um, but yeah, you know, then, then you spend six months doing nothing but bobbling it around in your head. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and you get addicted to it and, yeah. and all that. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, what are you working on now? What's next? Right now I'm working on a, a book which will be contemporary, take place right now in L.A., because I, I find L.A. a bottomless well of fascinating yes, history. Do. And it's going to involve freeways. Joan Didion has written some interesting stuff about freeways. Uh, and I, just like I read Cord Wainer Smith to get the two dimensional <laughs> guys, I read Joan Didion to sort of get a kind of attitude about freeways. And so, uh, and of course, it'll involve lots of supernatural mm -hmm. stuff and car chases and gunfights and such. Yeah, well, I look forward to it. Um, well, we're out of time. I want to thank you very much for uh, joining me here. Oh, thank you. It's been fun. Yeah, and for all of us here at Fast Forward and at Capclave, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.